welcome to Health Live at Seniors today. We are delighted to have you with us yet again. I'm told the fourth time, I, I, I'm not just, I'm told, I know um, he has been around uh, with our various sessions in the past as well. We have leading gastroenterologist, Dr. Prasanna Shah. Today, he is going to be speaking about endoscopy and colonoscopy for senior citizens. Uh, Dr. Shah needs no introduction, but to those who have not been in, his, in these sessions in the past, Dr. Prasanna Shah is a leading consultant interventional gastroenterologist and is attached to the Breach Candy, Jaslok, and Saifi hospitals in Mumbai. He has vast experience in therapeutic endoscopy and now uh, metabolic correction endoscopy for weight loss. Delighted to have you here with us again, Dr. Shah. So, will we just introduce you about you know, and, and thanks for being here once again. And um, uh, so what's the scene? Uh, you know, this is a question which every we, we all, we start our sessions because we started at the time when COVID happened to, uh, to our world. Uh, you know, since you are there in some of the top hospitals in Mumbai and some of these top hospitals in Mumbai were, saw the cases of the, in the second wave, what do you see uh, the situation now is about the third wave because we are in September? Yeah. So what it was, you know, a scenario around six to eight months back. And now there's a big change. There is a huge change. And we are seeing very less number of cases now coming in for COVID. Our ICUs are not so full as what they used to be full. Our wards are not so full as what they used to be full. The rate of number of admissions per day for COVID patients have drastically dropped. Couple of things is one is I think because most of the people are now adhering to COVID norms. And the second is the vaccine. Everybody's taken the vaccines. I believe around 20% of Mumbai's population has taken the vaccine twice, but more than one crore have been vaccinated at least with one vaccine, which is, which is a good thing. I mean, if you ask me what's the Ramban, the Ramban is the vaccine. And so therefore, that's the best thing to have just now to protect yourselves. And there has been a good study from England itself where they saw healthcare workers who had taken the vaccine, the first dose and the second dose, and they compared the groups. And the good thing about it is that in both the groups, there was no mortality and the CT score was zero. The CT scan score was as close to zero. So... It definitely proves that the vaccine has helped and I urge everybody to go for the vaccine. All right. It is, it is very important because we are, I'm, I'm, I'm addressing senior citizens. They're all above 65, 70, 75. You'll have comorbidities. If you all don't have also, it is better that you take a vaccine because your innate immunity would be a little low and this virus is very tricky. Uh, we ourselves are learning a lot more about the virus. It will take time. But I think the take-home message is take the virus, stay indoors, be safe, wear your masks, and sanitize your hands. The key thing, of course, is that, you know, I think most of the people who are, who are here because they are fairly aware of uh, health concerns and issues and taking care of themselves, they have taken the jabs, both the jabs. Now, the question is, when, you know, do they now wait for the booster dose to happen or not? You know, some of their families who members who are not uh, above 45, they're still waiting for their second dose. And of course, since life has kind of gotten back to normal, how do they really manage themselves? So clearly what you said is that keep, uh, keep hygiene levels high, keep safe distance and, and all of that. Uh, but how do you take care of yourself? How do you, you know you are meeting patients on a regular basis, and, uh, uh, and you know you are in a in a sense on the front line? How yeah. do you, what do you do? So 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 the first thing is uh, we've we've taken our vaccines, so we know that you know we're we're so confident that we have the vaccine with us, so that's like a protective shield. The N95 masks, not even the five layer or the three layered mask or double masks. Uh, we advocate the N95 mask to be worn. It's very uncomfortable initially, but then you get used to it and make sure that you change your masks every 72 hours or you wash them and you can reuse them. 
or you just keep buying new ones and dispose them off. When you dispose them off, make sure that you tear the mask and you cut those, uh, 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 you know, you cut the elastic so that your uh, uh, the round which is there that is cut and it is open so it doesn't get stuck in animals which we've which we've seen in the last right. three months. Absolutely. We've seen I that. Think that that's a huge issue. Yes, so and I think that care has to be taken. Um, plus, we try and maintain as much social distance. We sanitize ourselves, and um, obviously take a shower twice a day. Um, come back home and immediately go in. The the clothes are separate, so you know these things are there. And obviously, the last but not the least, pray and go to the hospital. Come back and thank the Lord that yeah everything has gone well and it's it's a new day coming ahead. So I guess that's it. I'm I'm sure everybody's doing that. So that's it. Absolutely, you know the in a, in a country where you do believe uh, a, a lot in what God, uh, you know, uh, can do for you. This is, um, you know, clearly a, a prayer is important. So let's get to the uh, get to the topic of the day, which yeah. is endoscopy and uh, colonoscopy. Perhaps you could just share a few words uh, initially, and then we can get to the question. So. Those of you who have questions for Dr. Shah, please put them in the Q&A tab and we will be uh, happy to uh, uh, have these addressed by Dr. Shah as always. Over to you, Dr. Shah. Yeah. So basically today's topic, I thought is important that people should know what is endoscopy and colonoscopy and what do these terminologies mean? Now, endoscopy is a form of an investigation where there is a thin slender tube and this this tube uh, has at the end of it has a camera has a light and uh, it is put through the mouth we visualize the food pipe we, we visualize the stomach and a part of the small intestine the endoscopy is also called ogd scopy that is the esophago gastro duodenoscopy that means it is an upper gi endoscopy endoscopy is a broad word so you have OGD scopy and a colonoscopy. So that's the OGD scopy, which, which basically gives us visualization of the upper GI tract up to the second, third part of the duodenum. That is a small intestine. The colonoscopy is a is again a a, a a slender tube. It's much longer than the upper GI tube, and we visualize the whole of the colon. So the whole of the colon entails the rectum, the sigmoid colon, the descending, the splenic flexure, the transverse colon, the hepatic flexure, the ascending colon, and the cecum, which is the start of the colon, and the IC valve where the small intestine ends and joins the large intestine. That's called the IC valve. And we go into the small intestine and we see the last 10, 20 centimeters also of the small intestine. So these are two uh, procedures which are, which are done right from infant to old age. They are, they are very safe. The complication rates or the side effects of an endoscopy or a colonoscopy is very, very rare. It is mostly an OPD procedure. You need not get admitted unless and until something needs to be repaired or checked inside, which is causing you a problem. Or if you're admitted, then uh, the upper GI endoscopy is divided into two, just like colonoscopy. We have to do diagnostic or we have to do therapeutic. Diagnostic is we do this investigation, this procedure to diagnose what's the problem. Is there a problem in the food pipe? Is there a problem in the stomach? Is there a problem in the small intestine or the duodenum? We also look at any pathology in the food pipe, like an ulcer, a cancer, a hernia, or a Barrett's esophagus, okay? or if there are any other strictures. So that is what we see in an upper GI endoscopy. Then we come to the stomach. Stomach, we see whether we have any inflammation, ulcers, infection. The H. pylori infection is a very important infection. It resides in the stomach. It's a very smart bacteria, which can reside in an acidic medium. So it's usually, you know, covered by a mucin layer and it, and it is right there. So we can detect H. pylori, we can detect cancers of the stomach. Then in the small intestine, we can detect whether there are ulcers in the small intestine, whether there is celiac disease or not, malabsorption diseases or not, or inflammatory bowel disease. 10% of the population can have even 
uh, inflammatory bowel disease, which can be which can be uh, diagnosed on an upper GI endoscopy. If you see multiple small small ulcers, what we call as erosions in the duodenum, we can take biopsies also. So that's the advantage. Now I prefer to do all my endoscopies under sedation. So what is this sedation? We have an anesthetist who sedates the patients by giving them what we call short conscious sedation. It's basically a sedation which numbs the brain. So you don't know what's happening. You're basically numb from your, your neck down. And once the procedure is over, we wake you up and in 45 minutes, you go home. You come walking, you go walking. During the procedure, important parameters like pulse rate, heart rate, blood pressure, they're all seen. And if we find any blip, the procedure is stopped and the corrective measures can be taken. So it is, it is, it's, it's a very safe procedure now. And the complication rates in a diagnostic endoscopy is close to nil. And uh, in therapeutic, it depends upon what therapy we are doing. And they can have some procedure related side effects, which I can say rather than saying complications, procedure related side effects can be there, which are again, very minuscule 0.001 to 0.01 percent of the of, of all the endoscopies done worldwide. There are more than, you know, 100,000 scopies being done uh, worldwide, this huge number because this test is easily available. It's easily done. Um, but mind you, it has to be, we, we all go through a training program. So uh, the, the endoscopist who's doing the endoscopy is very well trained. They've already done a lot of scopies. And so therefore, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's good and it is widely available to a lot of people. Whenever somebody says an endoscopy, then people are wondering what it is. So that's exactly what I told you. It's a thin slender tube, which is passed through the throat, food pipe, stomach, and small intestine, and the colonoscopy is from down. Uh, how do you come for uh, endoscopy? Common, que common questions which people ask, do we brush and come? Yes, you can brush and come. You can have your blood pressure tablets in the morning. You have to stop your blood thinners prior to, a couple of days prior to the scopy, and you have to stop your diabetes medicines. And then you come for your endoscopy or OGD scope or colonoscopy. Do you eat anything and come? No, you have to be fasting. You have to be fasting for a minimum of six hours. Can you have a sip of water prior to the scopy? Probably two or three hours. You can have a half a glass of water just if you're very thirsty or you're parched. Now in an, in an OGD scopy or an upper GI endoscopy, you don't, you don't require any preparation. The only preparation is you come fasting. But in a colonoscopy, what do we do? <laughs> There is a certain preparation we give the night prior or on the same day. Uh, these are basically large volume laxatives where you drink around 1.5 to 2 liters of some medicine, which is put there, uh, which is mixed with the water and you consume the water. By doing that, what happens is you are causing a lot of, uh, a lot of diarrhea. So this is basically drug induced diarrhea. Don't get worried. And the, the important part is that this diarrhea, which we are, we, are, we are inducing, it is basically washing the colon. It's cleaning the colon from within. So, so that is very important because if there is stool which is smeared the colon, we cannot look at polyps. Now, polyps are important. Why? Because these polyps can become cancerous later on. The incidence of polyps in India is definitely less because of our diet and because of the food which we have which is a good fiber food and an antioxidant food. But we have seen in the last 10 to 15 years in practice that there is an increasing trend of polyps which can be detected in colonoscopy. Mind you, the polyps in colonoscopy have to be taken out because over a period of time, they can become cancerous. So the take home message is, <clears throat> one is if you're above 50, you need to do a screening colonoscopy. Also, if you're completely asymptomatic because polyps can present as bleeding and cancer. They are completely asymptomatic. You need not have symptoms to detect any polyps. So that is, that is one thing very important that you need a screening colonoscopy at the age of 50. If it is normal, then 60. Then depending on what you find at 60, every three years or five years. 
so this is a screening program which is which is advocated by the american gastroenterology association um, so this is what we follow these are you know certain basic guidelines so there are guidelines for screening colonoscopies like polypectomies which if you have to do similarly there are screening guidelines for ogd scopies basically we want to look for barrett's esophagus now what is barrett's esophagus barrett's esophagus is basically a <laughs> precancerous condition where there is a tongue like projection of a mucosa which you get to see in the lower end of the food pipe that can become cancerous and can cause problems so you can you can also do screening for barrett's those people who have constant reflux or acidity and above 50 the incidence of barrett's again in india is a little low as compared to the west probably because we have a lot of abuse of antacids and it's like otc drugs so the more the less antacids you take less reflux you have and the less uh, incidence of barrett's that's how i can put it but because of obesity we are seeing a lot more problems of reflux of barrett's and uh, uh, other other complications because of obesity so that is one thing which one has to look out for so i have i have just spoken to you about diagnostic and and therapeutic upper gi and colonoscopies what is the preparation how much time it takes and once the preparation once the procedure is over you can go home and uh, then you can talk to your uh, physician uh, whenever he calls you back for a follow up or not that's that's the thing any questions pradeep thank you doctor uh, we have a few questions that have come in But the first question is uh doctor how do i ensure that i never have to do an endoscopy well that's a million dollar question and even i would love you know because uh, doing a procedure is obviously always you have it in the back of the mind the wellness of the patient and and for the and for the doctor so i think important is let's get back to basics and what's the basics you eat right you sleep well you exercise regularly and i think you should be fairly well so basically no vices no vices means you have to lead a very healthy lifestyle no alcohol no smoking no tobacco no late nights no parties are we willing to do this i don't know but if we do it great i'm sure that a lot of us will be in in good health and then you won't you won't need these kind of procedures at all if you are just well and healthy so important is measure your bmi your body mass index the upper limit is 24.9 so that is that is important so you have to anybody above 24.9 start incorporating healthy lifestyles so that is that is important so that is the only way one can ensure that you don't ever require an endoscopy right thank you uh, we have a question from uh, navin chandra shetty He says doctor your opinion about colon cleansing or flushing So I think he's asking about uh, 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 people who go in for a uh, for a colon hydrotherapy. That's right. <laughs> well, there were some papers which came in the middle and said that it was beneficial, and it showed some good promise. People still feel that okay, you know, one can go ahead and do it. But in my experience, I have I have seen a couple of patients after colon hydrotherapy have had actually some complications and some serious complications. So I would reserve my opinion. of colon cleansing i think more important is just hydrate yourself have good fiber you know have uh, 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 just do some uh, uh, you know do some relaxation exercises and uh, make sure you're not stressed and you will pass some good uh, stools and so i don't think you'll require colon cleansing at all but colon cleansing is something completely different than colonoscopy so a lot of people say oh colonoscopy can i do colon cleansing no colon cleansing is blind they just push in water you remove water you are not seeing what's happening inside you don't know what is happening inside you don't know what's the mucosa inside the lining inside polyps pouches what we call diverticulize very common um, especially in old age that is diverticulize so they are basically defects in the colonic wall which makes the colon more weak and more constipation and so you get into that vicious cycle it's important to know because these diverticuli can become inflamed and cause uh diverticulitis the other thing what can do is that those colon those diverticulitis can perforate or bleed so 
that is the difference between colon cleansing and a colonoscopy right thank you uh, we have a question from uh, devendra gada who says how is it related to weight loss endoscopy or colonoscopy so there are there are couple of there are couple of procedures which we do endoscopically for weight loss and that's the only way one can uh, correlate endoscopy and colonoscopy uh, the effects of obesity all right like what i was saying reflux and all those things <coughs> can be diagnosed by endoscopy so that's the way you can take a correlation or two we can now treat obesity non surgically completely non surgically is putting in a silicon balloon in the stomach and we keep it in there for 6 months to 1 year and we it's all done through the mouth and pulled out through the mouth it's again an opd procedure or the second thing what we do is we suture the stomach from inside again by endoscopy there is no cutting there's nothing there no is there are no incisions it's a one day hospital stay and you're back home these two procedures are also called metabolic procedures because they kind of reverse all your ills of metabolism if if i may say so that means it corrects your diabetes corrects your cholesterol corrects your blood pressure lowers your thyroid problems and reduces fat by reducing fat what are you doing all the effects of obesity from top to bottom are getting corrected for me especially being a gastroenterologist we look a lot at nash that's non alcoholic steatohepatitis that is fatty liver so that is that is important uh why obesity and liver is connected and how would you uh, uh rate this vis-a-vis bariatric surgery bariatric is still the gold standard for for weight loss but we have seen you know complications we have seen side effects of bariatric surgery uh the advantage of metabolic endoscopy is they can be reversed the balloon if you do not tolerate it we can puncture the balloon and take it out we are not cutting the stomach or we are not changing the anatomy if you are taking the sutures the sutures technically in 3 years they open up and the stomach opens up again so we are not doing that so that is that's one of the biggest advantages of endoscopy and metabolic endoscopy versus bariatric surgery we are seeing good amount of weight loss but yes i have to admit that we cannot mimic bariatric weight loss as compared to endoscopy but we are getting there it's it's as close to as that thank you we have a question from mr mc raju who asks uh, can you please elaborate on crohn's disease is it curable and how does it enter our body so crohn's disease is basically an inflammatory bowel disease and you can detect it by doing you know colonoscopy where you will get to see after ulcerations either in the ileum or in the colon and the the hypothesis generally is inflammatory bowel disease is because of some contaminated food and water and in, infection which causes this or a certain type of a protein in the milk which can cause problems and ulcerations in the colon there is a certain there are tablets and medicines which can be given for crohns and uh, that's it so basically we can diagnose crohns by doing a colonoscopy uh we have a question from an anonymous attendee can endoscopy detect lung infections like covid no but endoscopy can detect what we call hiatus hernias that is part of the stomach going into the chest where you can have regurgitation of food or your refluxing and you can have large volume refluxes because the 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 hiatus can be large and because of these hiatus hernia you can develop aspiration pneumonias and you can develop chronic cough and that can be one of the things which can be diagnosed on an endoscopy that if you are refluxing plus you have what we call as a laryngopharyngeal reflux you have what we call as lpr and that can be the acid comes and hits the throat it causes a it causes sinusitis post nasal drip and that's how you can diagnose it you can have a hoarse voice you can have a change in character of voice you can constantly have something like clear you know clearing your throat <clears throat> you'll keep hearing people doing that so that means you know your your throat your voice box is getting irritated because of probably reflux so that's a time when an endoscopy might be beneficial so you can ask your physician that 
Thank you. We have, in fact, a question from uh, Mr. C. A. Shah, who says, "Is uh, is uh, slight is hiatus hernia a serious issue, and does it need surgery? Can it cause chest pain?" So there are types and grades of hiatus hernia. So if it's a mild, a small hiatus hernia, nothing to be done. You just give on. You just put them on medication. But if they are large hiatus hernia, then obviously you require to look at it and we only object we only subject those patients to surgery uh which is again a fairly a standard procedure and uh, it's 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 not a major surgery as such it requires to a two two days maximum hospitalization done laparoscopically also by the by by you know very good surgeons who we have in all the three hospitals and uh, uh, only if they are large hiatus hernia you can subject them to surgery Large hiatus hernia, yes, can produce chest pain. They can produce cough. They can produce hematemesis, that is vomiting of blood. So, yes, it can. Right. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Mr. Lakshmi Narayan, and uh, in fact, he asked this question to our ENT surgeon last week, and uh, a, a thing about he has a polyp in his in his voice box identified last month. Medicines have not helped. Uh, but the doctors don't think it is cancerous what is the probability that that it could be cancerous very difficult to answer that because you know it's the voice box polyp i i probably won't be able to tell you clearly your ent surgeon who's who who will take out the polyp or has but has the polyp been removed i mean i i don't understand that he hasn't mentioned that uh he has been uh, Oh, he has. It's just identified last month, so I don't think it has been uh, removed. No, so it's it's difficult to say whether they are they are malignant or not. So the best would be the ENT surgeon would give you a a clear cut answer as to what, unless it has caused some obstructive symptoms to the voice and breathing, then obviously it has to be removed. You know, I must tell you, Doctor Shah, that Mr. Lakshmi Narayan, as lax as he is called. Has an amazing voice, and I'm so saddened to hear about this. And I really hope uh, that he gets better. And he has just, just said that no, the polyp has not been removed. Okay, okay. That he should. What do you recommend that he should get it removed ASAP? Is it? You know, the, it it all depends upon how much how how much of symptomatology has, and that best the ENT will tell him. So you can just go to a very good ENT surgeon, you know, and then he can just. He can just uh, take their opinion. Uh, those polyps are different from the polyps which we see in the stomach and the colon. So I don't think I'll be able to really comment on it. I can only tell you that if it's causing a problem, get looked at it, and uh, yeah, get it sorted out. Right. I saw one. Uh, I saw one question here That's... by Mr. Shetty. How to di distinguish traces of blood in stool if it's due to colon problem or piles? Right. <clears throat> you do a stool test and see for occult blood. positive negative if it's frank blood and painless it could be piles but we would always subject them to a colonoscopy because in elderly age group bleeding per rectum can be more than just that they are called alarm symptoms it could be cancer it could be a polyp it could be diverticular bleed so it's better you get a colonoscopy done right uh we have a question from uh, uh mr bhadra kumar mehta Who says my wife suffers from stomach pain? She has done her sonography and endoscopy, CT scan, and all are clear. But then, why does she have a pain in the stomach? She is seventy-nine years old. Well, there are many reasons for pain in the stomach. So he he has to get further investigated by some blood tests and all that. Whether they are taking any Ayurvedic medicines, no Ayurvedic medicines, is she on any painkillers, no painkillers? So there are a lot of questions which one needs to be asked. and i mean they you know we need to take a detailed history and then only come to know why she's having this pain pain in the stomach right we have a question from faida shah who says what is the care for bleeding diverticular diverticular colitis yeah. so bleeding diverticular colitis is basically an emergency because the bleed can be small to a very high volume bleed is better that you get yourself into an hospital <clears throat> and get it checked definitely and uh, if the bleeding persists then a surgeon needs to come because 
then the surgeon can the surgeon can think of you know doing a colectomy or doing a colonoscopy finding which <coughs> sorry which uh, which uh, diverticula is bleeding and then if necessary do what we call as a sclerotherapy but that's all temporary to to you know stop the bleeding so they they can prepare for surgery plus we also need to know how many episodes of bleeding have occurred is it the first episode second or the third based on that then a decision for surgery will have to be made right uh, lax we have a message from uh, jamila mulki who is also one of the participants of uh, seniors have talent and she said that you know she's felt bad and we will all be praying for him so as uh, dr shah recommended that you should get it examined by a by an ent surgeon you are in you are in bengaluru and you have very good surgeons there okay we have a question from um, navin chandra shetty who says doctor will continuous intake of steroid supplements for cortisol have an effect on colon health no not have an effect on the colon health but it definitely have a effect on the stomach lining which can produce gastritis so that's one of the things which we see drug induced gastritis because of the uh, steroids being given right thank you we have another thing which i saw um, yeah. pradeep is uh, how often one can use suppositories that's right I husband who is 73 uses yeah. auto well suppositories is only in an emergency situation there are a good number of laxatives which are available either otc or visit your gastroenterologist he'll give you a good laxative and then you can you know use those laxatives continuously laxatives are safe they are not habit forming because we have we have good number of laxatives which you know need not be habit forming so i think you should look into that rather than anything else right uh, we have a question from uh, dj santa maria who asks is there any relation between gastro and water retention gastro and, and water, water retention and uh, anaphylaxis anaphylaxis no so water retention can only happen in gi when uh, your liver is weak when you have cirrhosis of liver you can have water retention or for any odd reason your kidneys get fired out you can have water retention but nothing related to to this yeah and uh, his other the question other important is, the, the other important thing which i just wanted to highlight which i did not mention is a lot of patients have you know we've seen with cirrhosis of liver cirrhosis of liver is a is a serious condition where the liver gets shrunken and it causes portal hypertension what is that is basically a hypertension in the portal veins which can manifest as engorged veins in the food pipe in the stomach and in the also in the small intestine the food pipe veins can burst and cause massive amounts of blood vomiting of blood what we call hematemesis so therefore it is important that when you have cirrhosis of liver you do a, that's where the importance of endoscopy and therapy comes in we do what we call as a procedure called evl endoscopic varicel ligation where we go in with an endoscope and we put rubber bands on these varices so that they don't bleed it's all to prevent bleeding plus through an endoscope we can go and inject what we call as a glue in in what we have fundal varices so you can inject a glue there and that can be also good right thank you we have a question from uh, 78 year old nisar ukaboy who says i have irritable bowel movement can you please advise <laughs> there is what i i don't know what to say i mean how to uh, advise him is just that the 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 question is ibs can, is is like a waste paper basket diagnosis it's after you eliminate all the causes of the symptoms then you think it is ibs so i think he needs to just get you know he needs to get uh, investigated that's that's all i can say on this forum i can't say anything more right thank you uh, we have a question from meenal bajaj i know it's a it's a tricky question because i i don't think you know but but in case you can name names she says can you suggest a few laxative names there are num- there are number of ones which are available that's lactulose lactilol isabgol these are all good laxatives i can't i i'm not going to take drug names or pharma names but i'm just giving you the product names the 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 drug names but doctor is it is it fine to have isabgol because there are people who just 
you know pop some is a goal after you know a meal every every day it's it's natural husk it's a bulking agent it's it's very good it's a bulking agent and it's it also kind of protects the the colon so taking isab gul after the age of 50 for bowel movements is absolutely okay but let me tell you that isab gul in some people who have a who have a tendency of a constipation can worsen it also so you have to be careful so it depends on what you have do you have it with water or what do you have it with you can have it with water you can have it with milk you can have it with your food you can have it with rice you can have it with in 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 many forms right thanks we have a question from two questions we have one question from raghavendra odia who says is it safe to take enema for flushing the colon it is safe and um, uh, yeah so that's what devendra gada is saying but he asks whether is it safe to take it regularly no as i as i already mentioned it earlier you cannot take it regularly it's only taken as an sos after you've tried all laxatives so please uh, please remember that right uh, we have a question from um, brijendra kumar is there any alternative to removal of of gall bladder with multiple stones as it causes severe pain this is for my daughter who's 40 years plus under the advice of of a gastro who has done endoscopy and then a, a sonography so she has gall bladder stones and she has pain she's symptomatic you right. need to further investigate i mean sonography but what are other changes of any gall bladder related changes is there pericholecystic fluid is there inflammation in the gall bladder does she have fever pain jaundice what we typically call as charcot striad does she have all those symptoms and signs then one must go because gall stones you know asymptomatic gall stones 80% of the population can have them right we have a question from suresh khate who says do weight loss and strict diet control reduce the level uh, of fatness and fats on pancreas what medical treatment is prescribed weight loss treatments and uh, dieting definitely can reduce the fat in the pancreas it can reduce fat everywhere from your belly from the liver from the pancreas we have a few questions that have come in by mail uh, which i'm just going to read out uh, the one is uh, about uh, the impact of covid on uh, on 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 the body and the need for checking the intestines and you know crohn's disease and all of that how much does it does covid have an impact on the stomach and the intestines so post covid we are seeing a lot of uh, patients having unexplained pain abdomen so that is one thing we have seen patients with pancreatitis we have seen patients with abdominal pain we do everything everything is normal so you know there are these couple of subsets where we are seeing these problems pre existing problems can get aggravated because covid being a stress and in the stress the pre existing conditions can get aggravated so that's the only way one can uh, correlate with it for for any related complications like bleeding or bleeding per rectum or hematemesis one can do an endoscopy or a colonoscopy right we have a question from um so we have a question from mr jay kumar of uh, bengaluru he says uh, dr ulcers developed in the stomach intestinal tract as a result of consumption of aspirin on a regular basis for heart ailments uh, can this be cured with simple medication without disturbing the in- intake of uh, aspirin the report of endoscopy and colonoscopy can be considered valid for how long a period and how frequently fresh reports need to be generated for revisits for consultant consultation subsequently all all very pertinent points i must say very good questions now aspirin is a double edged sword one you require it and two it can cause a lot of uh, ulcers and bleeds and irritation to the gastric mucosa so that is that is so uh, uh, that is what we see now there are drugs which can neutralize the effect of the aspirin on the gastric mucosa so you double the dose of your ppi that is your proton pump inhibitor or you use a molecule causes dexlanzoprazole 
that's a good molecule where people can use for incense how how often one does an endoscopy colonoscopy it is mainly on the symptoms if you are having occult blood which is coming positive or you are passing blood or you have hematemesis only that time one needs to do an endoscopy just to keep checking whether there is ulcerations going or not you don't need to do endoscopy symptoms are good enough thank you uh, we have two questions on uh, the basis of what you said dr i used to have isab goal on alternative days on alternate days but was advised to stop as my kidneys are weak your opinion so basically isab pulls, pulls a lot of water and if it pulls a lot of water you know the kidneys can get damaged so that's the thing so then it's better you don't have that you have another molecule for it so you can have lactulose you can have lactulol or you can have uh, you know some some other tablets which are available we have a question from we have a question from raghavendra odia who says i am taking kayam chun for the last 35 years every day for relieving my con chronic constipation and enjoying good health can you confirm that this practice is safe i can't i don't know anything about kayam chun the very fact that you've enjoyed 35 years of health just continue it that's all i can say <laughs> uh, kayam chun has been very heavily advertised and i'm sure uh, that has an impact uh, we have a question from brijendra kumar uh, who says i'm 77 years old and suffer from frequent constipation i'm also a heart patient so can't exert more to pass the stool please advise a non habit forming lex laxative so that's that's another very good question because we get to see a lot of cardiac patients who cannot strain because they strain then the heart can become into a problem so uh, there are uh, good laxatives which are uh, uh, which are available so uh, there is a polyethylene glycol it's a molecule you can use that that's non habit forming a uh, 4450 or there are other strengths which are available and you can try using those and those will give you good good diet some of the good fruits which you can do is you can have anjeer you can have papaya you can have prunes prune juices these are all natural good laxatives one can have right thank you uh, we have two questions on fatty liver one is from yasmin todiwala who says what is fatty liver and how to deal with this and by sujoy mc the question is what's the best diet for fatty liver i think fatty liver is a completely different discussion it doesn't come into endoscopy and colonoscopy all i can tell you there is fat in the liver you have to be aware of it reduce your weight and make sure you correct all your metabolic uh, parameters like diabetes blood pressure and cholesterol fatty liver should come down right thank you we have was one more question um two more questions one first one is uh, doctor almost thrice uh, almost weekly thrice i feel pukish in the morning and a lot of acid water comes out is there something i should worry about uh, nothing to worry but it is i think bothersome so you should come and visit a gastroenterologist that's very important so it can be investigated why you're puking and why you're having acid reflux it could be motility problem it could be an infection so that needs to be asserted so it's best that you come and uh, you know see a gastroenterologist uh thank you and the last one is doctor is there i i don't live in a big city i need to know as to how do i consult uh, a doctor for endoscopy because in my town there's no uh, endoscopy done is there some way i can do uh, uh something by a teleconsult or by a phone call well uh nobody can do an endoscopy teleconsult uh, uh, by doing you know telemedicine uh, methods so you will require to i think first take a consultation with a doctor and then i don't know where you are from so if you are in a small town or a village you can go to your uh, the closest city or the closest town where there are good number of doctors now who are doing endoscopies also so uh, pradyuman i really would not be able to answer because i don't know from which area she is coming is she coming from a hilly area is she coming from an island i mean i really don't know yeah i don't think that's mentioned uh but uh, doctor are you available for teleconsults is there is there something that we you know if somebody has an issue can they can they 
Yes. Help you beyond this. Uh, I have been I have been doing teleconsultation right from day one of COVID because people are a little scared to come to my clinic. So my clinic, which is Ayush GI Care, located at Gram Devi, uh, the number is two three six seven six five nine. Just one second. Just one second. Ayush GI Care. Yeah. So I'm putting it in the chat for everybody. Yeah. And Ayush the, GI Care. It's B forty one. B forty one. Geeta Building. Geeta Building. Next to Gram Devi Police Station. Right. And uh, the area is Gram Devi, South Bombay. And what's the phone number? You said two three six seven, two three six seven, six five nine eight, six five nine eight, or eight three. They're the two numbers. You all can contact my clinic, and we can schedule a online consult, which is good enough. So I have put the chat, uh, the the address in the in the chat box over here. and as always we will have the uh, this this the video of this interview of the session on seniors today on monday as well as takeaways from the session so please uh, look at that on uh, on monday the, the in the webinars box as well as on the home page of seniors today dot in and uh, thank you very much once again uh, dr shah for for having been here and as always uh, as um, uh, mr rajnikant gilani has said it was an informative session indeed and we've not had something on endoscopy and uh, colonoscopy in the past and uh, uh, it was it was really informative and thank you very much once again and and as always we will have uh, health live at seniors today uh, next week that is saturday uh september 11th at 5 pm we have a session by a leading urologist once again as per the 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 request of uh people over here when you had uh, uh requested for a urologist so we have that here in case you have any suggestions any requests for opinion for uh, for doctors please write to us at uh, editor at seniorstoday.in that is e d i t o r at seniors today dot in so please write to us we'll be happy to uh, look at uh, certain ailments certain certain um, areas that we have perhaps not touched so far or we have and you know you feel that it's it's important to get 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 somebody to give you expert advice once again thank you once again dr shah for for being here and thank you uh, everyone for being part of the audience today thank you pradeep thank you seniors today Thank you so much. Bye bye.